Wait, remember 16? Who am I kidding? Of course you do. I've seen the comments asking for this video to be made. Canadian animated sitcom series 16 starred a group of six friends who work at, but never seem to leave, their local Galleria Mall. Running for a solid four seasons from 2004 to 2010, the series made its debut in Canada on Teletoon, Sunday, November 7th, 2004 at 6 p.m. It's a show created for young teens, and the creative team was incredibly dedicated to that, as this certain demographic was found to be watching more and more adult media for the more intelligently written content. They reflected that in a show that both marketed towards young kids but was more complex in character development and interpersonal relationships. Today, we are going to take a look at what this iconic slice of life mall rat show was all about, what happened to it, and more. Also, thanks to its iconic, extremely catchy theme song, even if you don't remember the show very well, you probably remember the intro. And speaking of intros, it's almost as cool as mine. taking the day off. Any objections? They never listen. The girls of the group are Nikki Wong, the purple-haired, quick-witted, and sarcastic girl with alternative style, Jen Masterson, the athletic, responsible, and strong-willed one, and Caitlin Cook, the friend with a very sheltered elitist upbringing, but who proves herself to be fiercely loyal and kind. The boys include Wyatt Williams, the musically talented, soft-spoken, and anxiety-ridden friend, Jonesy Garcia, a lazy and arrogant serial flirter who, despite some of his pretty immoral and sometimes downright illegal activities, Activities, does care deeply for his friends. You grow to like him. Kinda. And last, but oh my gosh, so very much not least, Jude Lazowski, an absent-minded, mellowed-out skater boy who constantly surprises with his wisdom and honesty. His heart is always in the right place. The show starts off with a group of five friends, but they get their iconic sixth friend when Jen gives her classmate Caitlin her old job at the Squeeze Lemonade Stand, because Caitlin's father cuts her off due to a few rather large purchases causing her credit card to max out. The six slowly get to know Caitlin over the course of the following episode, due to the squeeze being their prime hangout spot, where they can't get busted by Paul Blart, I'm sorry, I mean Ron the rent -a -cop for loitering. Together, they navigate an after-school social and work life while learning how to be good friends to each other. Sixteen was originally created by Canadian power duo Jennifer Perched and Tom McGillis, who also created shows like My Babysitter's a Vampire, all of the Total Drama Island cinematic universe, and Stoked. They even produced Lucas the Spider together, and I don't care what anyone says, Lucas the Spider is adorable. 16 was originally titled The Mall, but was later changed to 16 in development, and yeah, a much better and instantly more relatable name they decided on. The mall culture of the mid-2000s was the last time malls performed with any kind of success, with the economic recession in 2008 kickstarting what would be the unimaginable fall of the commercial giant, the North American Mall. Extensive studies beginning in 2017 started to predict the inevitable death and abandonment of the commercialized and widespread North American Mall. Not to mention, the last few years themselves and the start of the 2020s did nothing if not further progress that decline in profits for the stores that filled up the majority of malls out there. And additionally, the boom of Bezos e-commerce coupled with heavy oversaturation, there were not enough people who needed to go somewhere to get their things, leaving the hollow husk of what we know today as the dead mall. But 16 really got their timing right and took advantage of the phenomenon when it was still an important part of pop culture. I mean, it was it wasn't the 80s, but hey, malls were still popping. Get in, loser, we're going shopping. The show managed to capture that specific nostalgia I had for hanging out at the mall with my friends and being that insanely cool teenager I knew I was. All right, the show started airing when I was a bit younger to even be driving and going to the mall with friends, but it eventually equaled out with that and I eventually had some quality mall sesh hangouts. And fine, I wasn't that cool, okay? What do you want from me? The mall itself becomes a very unique and equally convenient place to throw six friends into a myriad of complex interpersonal social dynamics while dodging authority figures. There were clear-cut antagonists and or general oppressors that aren't their parents. Due to being set in a mall, Coach Halder and Pulp, I'm so sorry, I mean Ron the rent cop offer high stakes, which often leads to a member of the gang almost losing their jobs, in Jonesy's case, almost always losing his job, or being locked up in mall prison. So now, let's take a trip to the mall and take a deeper dive into the endless mega mall complex that is 16. Oh, I'm a genius. 16, starting November 7th. Tell it to you, it's unreal. Oops.
Typically, a show about 16-year-olds would fall back on school as the typical setting, but the Galleria Mall offers endless opportunities for the writing team. This world revolves around the mall as the social epicenter of their town. With stores coming in and out of business, any setting or any kind of character they wanted was achievable. We meet a different side character in almost each episode due to the setting being such a popular place. There are movie theaters, all kinds of fun restaurants, and a variety of clothing stores to represent the diverse teen social groups such as the Goths, the Clones, and the Jocks. It's where every group comes to clash. The concept of the Galleria Supermall is ever expanding to the plot's demands, which explains why Jonesy is able to find and get fired from a new job virtually every episode. 16 is somewhat of a formally decorated show as well, with a nomination for a Pulsanella Award in 2005, winning the award for Best of Children's Television to fall under the age group of 9 to 14 years old that year in the Alliance for Children in Television. The theme song, performed by Phil Nero, won a Daytime Emmy Award for Outstanding Original Song, as it should. Nero is a renowned veteran rock musician who has also worked with musicians who are a part of Kiss, Whitesnake, and Yes. The show also ranked in the top 10 series amongst kids 6 to 11 on its network. Despite its success in Canada, it didn't do nearly as well in the United States. This could be thanks to censorship, as up to 25 episodes of the 93-episode series were never permitted to air in the US. This is because of various different reasons, and believe me, there are a lot of them. Canada was considered more relaxed with their network guidelines, but when the show was given to Nickelodeon for the United States, many episodes of the show didn't make the cut. Some of those reasons include violence, addiction, cursing, objectification of the female body, crime, theft, suggestive themes, adultery, double dating, implied nudity, menstruation, and two episodes were banned because of side characters who were confirmed that they were gay. This could be why the show didn't do nearly as well as they'd hoped, because upon rewatch, some of the banned episodes are the most entertaining and memorable, as well as cut clear storyline parts out of the show that can confuse you if you don't watch them all. And a lot of what the banned episodes had to offer are really great, except when Jonesy actively commits a crime by spying on women without their consent, multiple times in different episodes. The art style is simple, using flash animation and staying away from harsh or bold outlines. The style is heavily geometric and can sometimes feel liminal, with sprawling real estate but not a lot to fill it up. It can sometimes just feel a bit empty. While I do wish there was more detail in the background art side of things, I do appreciate the general tone it gives the show. Everything suddenly feels less dramatic and more domestic, as opposed to its sister show, Total Drama Island, where there are more physically demanding and dangerous activities that condition the theme of the show and its locations to be its own character. The marketing team also capitalized on the Flash player craze of the 2000s by releasing a bunch of 16 online games that were available to be played on Nickelodeon and Cartoon Network websites. Sadly, with the brutal death of Flash Play Media, a select few have been re-uploaded to different sites, like a Sudoku-inspired minigame, as well as a Skate Challenge, an intense skating game that requires a lot of focus if you go on the intense mode. It was dare I say, intense. Also, games like Mall Rush and Barista Star were just a couple of the games that survived the great Flash games wipe. I think what really helps bring these characters to life in the show, aside from their relatability to either yourself or others that you may know, is the voice actors. Terry McGurin brought Jonesy's cocky but somehow clumsily charming character to life. Stacey DePass brought out the tough on the outside but sweet on the inside character of Nikki that somehow is also compatible opposite of Jonesy, potentially making him a better person? I'll let you be the judge of that. Christian Potenza offered the laid-back and chill vibes of Jude that remind me of at least a couple of the friends I had when I used to skateboard. Megan Fallenbach showed off the hard work ethic and the overachiever attitude of Jen. Jess Mall Givens gave those perfect hipster vibes with a social and economical conscience, if not coming off a little too pretentious to his friends and others sometimes. And of course, Brooke de Orsay, who played into the rich girl who needs to be humbled a bit and learn to be independent while establishing a friend group that will truly like her for her and not for material related motives. This all culminates in what feels like a real group of friends all from what on the surface would look like they would all be in different friend groups. There was a character here that you could place yourself in the shoes of and how these preconceived thoughts of, oh, 
this person would never hang out with that person, quickly fade away as the show spends its runtime dealing with all their differences that will overall bring them closer as a group rather than push them away. This show is great. I've personally watched it completely through about four or five times at this point as it's easy to throw on and enjoy. And at this point, I feel like it is a top five cartoon for me. I enjoy the setting and the characters so much as the slice of life genre is where my overall enjoyment lies. But as we move away from malls being the hangout spot or in existence in general, it feels like a time capsule that emulates those days. It feels nostalgic to a time that wasn't even that long ago, and I love returning to this era with a smile on my face reminiscing on the good old days of the past. But when one mall closes, another mall opens. Wait, that's not right. But you know what I mean. Uh, let's talk about the future of 16 now. I should go. Sorry. Later. Can't get enough of the mall? I'm home. Neither can these guys. Nick's got a brand new show about 16 working at the mall. In terms of any kind of revival, well, here are my thoughts. As of right now, nothing is in the works or being talked about. However, 16 sister show Total Drama Island was confirmed recently for a two-season revival through HBO Max and Cartoon Network with the original Survival Island concept. Not a spin-off with toddler versions of the characters and for some reason a young Jude from 16 is there without any side character driven subplots. No, the OG Total Drama Island, as far as we know, is coming back. The revival is something that which Fresh TV president and creator of both shows, Tom McGillis, initially denied ever being possible in a Reddit thread from 2018. Nope. Sorry to be a dream killer, but there's no market for this experience in the wider entertainment marketplace right now. However, our kids grew up and went on to do other things, so there is no market for a show like this right now, in my opinion. And that's okay. We just need to create something special and different for newer audience of varying age groups. Obviously, he was wrong about Total Drama, but what if this concept could be applied to 16? In 2018, we were given a 7-minute reunion mini-episode PSA titled Vote dude, in which the characters, now 18, discuss the varying socio-political climate of America. They hit as many hot topics as they can, and no, I'm not talking about the store that once was an alt haven but now is a Funko Pop and pop culture t-shirt store. They even root themselves into our universe by referencing American politicians by name. Anyways, they let Jude hotbox a lemon, and I think that's pretty funny. It's like letting Shaggy and Scooby-Doo canonically do the same, just with the mystery machine. Oh wait. They did. Okay, yeah, they were just cooking some food, sure. It all just felt so right. Heck, they really wanted this to stand out as there was blatant cursing as the clones diss on Nikki. It may sound like a shocking difference from the show that at least we got while growing up, but in the context of what the original non-censored Canadian version was, it felt right at home with the themes the show tackled and more true to life within my own or even your own friend groups. It ends with Garth pointing out that they are all Canadian citizens and don't necessarily need to be concerned with United States policies and lawmaking. This reunion gave us a taste of what a reboot potentially could look like. In the past, the episodes were heavily censored, and not in the way that we touched on earlier. This PSA lets them actually act like they normally would have as real teenagers. If a reboot were to happen, and it's entirely possible as we've learned from Total Drama, then it would have more freedom, possibly be on a more adult network, streaming service, or something that would offer that freedom, that would give them creative liberty to discuss adult themes as the adults that they are now, at the age of 18. Like McGillis said, something different for newer audiences of varying age groups. There's a lot of ground for them to cover with the death of the modern mall and the struggles that the Galleria would face, as well as the more adult themes that would make for some pretty interesting and again, relatable stories that anyone can find themselves in. If there isn't a total 18 revival, it's possible that we could get a spin-off or a fusion of the characters in a different show, similar to how McGillis and the Total Drama production team made Toddler Jude a prominent character in the AU Daycare spin-off Total Drama Rama. So what are your thoughts on a reboot for this? Do you think they could swing it towards a more mature audience? But also, in general, how do you feel about this show 16? Let me know in the comments. As always, thanks so much for watching and make sure to hit the like button and subscribe for more content like this. Follow me on Twitter and I'll be back with another video soon, but until then, later.